full twin audios. Stories created solely with the vintage soul in mind. O-T-R-T-S-T-A, what story can I connect you with today? I don't really need a story. I just wanted information. Very well. Tune your radio dial to anchor.fm slash soul twin audios. That's S-O-L-E. Soul Twin Talk, a backstage pass into productions at Soul Twin Audios through guest interviews, commentaries, promos, and featuring your teasers and trailers. This is Rachel Pulliam, creator of Soul Twin Audios, the podcast where you can hear old-time radio recreations, adaptations of stories from the public domain, and original series and episodes written either by myself or other audio drama collaborators. Today on Soul Twin Talk, Episode 2, I'm going to go into more detail about The Turn of the Screw and Fugue in C Minor. I will be interviewing several cast members from both shows. For the Summerstock Playhouse, The Turn of the Screw will be featured on July 10th, and Fugue in C Minor will air at the end of the month on July 31st. Look for those at MutualAudioNetwork.com. Please stay tuned past the credits because I'm including five really amazing promos and I can't wait to hear all of these productions. Jack West's Canterville Ghosts, October's Children, Radio Free Tyrannus, Marky Witt's Audio Works, The Cask of Amandiato, and Mercury Theater Podcast Universe 25. After the promos, you'll have the opportunity to hear a demo from a selected voice artist. This week, we'll hear from Diamond Matthews, who was kind enough to send me her commercial demo. If you'd like to connect with her, you can find her on Twitter at Ryan Ambrose. That's R-H-I-N-E-A-M-B-R-O-S-E. We'll be back after a word from our sponsors. This brochure will tell them. At Weston University, you don't have to worry about giving an arm and a leg to receive a great education. Or even a head? <laughs> no, but you'll certainly get a head by attending Weston's. Oh, gee. But college is expensive these days. I don't know if my parents could afford it. This brochure will tell them all they need to know. Western U offers a unique opportunity for all students who want to study a variety of subjects, including the sciences, foreign languages, technology, pre-med, and childcare. Ooh, also has a foreign exchange program. And that's a steal at only $1,250 each year for tuition. And it is affordable because it's right here in Salubrious Falls. At Weston, we'll supply your children with a solid foundation of knowledge and a ready work ethic. Call us today at Weston 2 If you call the town of Salubrious Falls your home, you'll know the Bellamy's take pride in catering to the needs of our residents. Back in 54, my father Edward gave you a brand new campus so your children could attend college locally. Today, in his memory, I'm giving our elder residents a chance at a comfortable life during their golden years in a wing near the hospital called The Cottages. Here, your loved ones will receive the utmost care from a talented staff of nurses and volunteers who will help rejuvenate them allowing you to make many more precious memories with them. Register in person today and ask for Sloan. When I started Patchwork Classics, I knew I wanted to premiere with an adaptation of Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. I love the ambiguity of the story, and I feel my adaptation was able to keep that aspect. If you're familiar with The Innocence, starring Deborah Carr, You'll hear my adaptation, and you'll understand that it takes inspiration from that version. I've been intrigued by this story ever since I was a child. I think I could identify with Flora, because when I was seven, I had my own ghostly encounter. Of course, as an adult, I can write it off and say I was tired, or I had an overactive imagination, 
but at the time, I was convinced of it. My mom sent me in her room for something, and for whatever reason, there was some kind of a metal folding chair in there. Well, when I went in, it was unfolded, and that's when I saw this figure of a man sitting there. He was eerie and staring at me, and it freaked me out. Of course, I ran out of the room, and just like in The Turn of the Screw with Griffin's ghost, I wanted that validation, so I went to get my mom. We returned to the room, and of course, there was nothing there. Not even a pile of clothes or some other kind of thing that would give me indication of what it could have been instead. And to this day, I'm still unsure of what I saw. Tanya Rich, The Governess the role of the governess in The Turn of the Screw is such an iconic role. Were you influenced by a previous actress who performed the role? I deliberately avoided watching any versions of the film. I remember watching it years ago, and it really stuck in my mind. I saw it more than once. I think I saw it when I was very young, and it really quite scared me. Um, so my performance, though, was entirely based on the era and the character of the governess. What was your favorite part working on The Turn of the Screw? Uh, for me, I always find the levels of madness a person can experience when trying to hold it together particularly interesting. I don't know why. Um, so I think I really enjoyed having that repressed anxiety and repressed feelings of being terrified that she might appear to be going mad, uh, knowing what they used to do with people that they suspected of being mad in those days. Also, the rules of the time and the, her gender uh, made her have to hide her complete hysteria. So she was that corseted, tight feeling, which I hope I've put across. I loved the angst of her. And so actually, when she's starting to unravel, that was my favourite part, really. What is your dream role? Oh, my dream role uh, really would be any female who's really complex. I particularly like heroines, though, that do teeter on the side of madness and are strong on the outside, but perhaps more frail on the inside. I must say that the confines of Victorian life really intrigue me. The apparent perfect wife coupled with the abandonment of the underbelly of, well, even high society is really quite fascinating. I think that corset really, that repression, but the sexuality of it really says everything you need to know about that era. And also, I really do love a corset. Oh, gosh, if I could play any part. Oh, my goodness, where do I begin? Um, I'd love to do like a radio drama version of Hedda Garbler or Miss Julie, both parts I know, um, and I would love to play. That would be a dream job. Uh, also, since I was a small child, actually, I've wanted to be a vampire. And uh, so to play a very powerful vampire queen in a fantasy would be awesome. Do you have any suggestions for a public domain story you'd like to hear Soul Twin Audios perform? What books? Well, I mean, another part I'd love to play, and it also is a book I'd love to, you know, that could be adapted, would be Wuthering Heights because Kathy, you know, she's got the madness. She's got the slowly unraveling, all the things I love. I don't know why I'm drawn to these women. Perhaps I'm giving too much away about myself. <laughs> anyway, um, other books, oh, I don't know, The Scarlet Letter, The Woman in White. Uh, the importance of being earnest, actually, because I've actually played Gwendolyn on stage. Um, so, yeah, the list is endless and the opportunities, hopefully, will be endless, too. One of the wonderful things about being a voice actor is it's all about your voice age and not your real age. Thank you for the interview. Fiona McKinnon as Mrs. Gross. Hi, Rachel, and huge thanks again for casting me as Mrs. Gross in Turn of the Screw. What was your favourite part of recording the role of Mrs. Gross? I really enjoyed playing this character. I think she's a real old retainer. She knows the house, Bly, very well. She's known the children since they were born and understands their characters. She's also the keeper of the secrets, though. It takes a long time for her to warm up, I think, and to understand if she can trust the new governess or not. Um, so she's a keeper of secrets. She's the old retainer. She helps the governess communicate, but without giving too much away. And I think my favourite part was probably from about scene 16, where it turns. She can under... She 
she trusts the governess and their relationship gets a bit closer. It feels as if they're in this together. I also really enjoyed playing the role with Tanya, who's playing the governess. We knew each other previously. Tanya was my voice coach and it was really good fun to record our parts together. And I think hopefully that will come across in the the final play. Were you inspired by any previous actress who played the role? I think for me, the 2009 version, it was a TV movie. And in that one, Mrs. Gross was played by Sue Johnson, a, a quite a well-known British actress. And just, you know, she just needed to raise an eyebrow in the, in the film version. She just did it really well. And for that version, Michelle Dockery, who's well-known now from Downton, she played the governess. It was fantastic. So that would be the one I liked the most, I think, of the previous versions. Do you have a dream role? I don't really have a dream role as such. I really enjoy playing... I guess you'd say older characters, either housekeepers, nurses, a granny, a mother with a history, or just someone with something about them. Something that is revealed as the audio drama unfolds or the film weaves its way to the end of the story. But I'm not averse to playing animals or men, particularly for Shakespeare. I've always played um, male characters with a male voice, and I quite enjoy the challenge of that as well. So up for anything, I guess. What other stories from the public domain would you like to hear Saltwin Audios produce? Well, I'm going to give you a favourite of mine from the place that I come from. I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland and there is a, a film that was set in 1932. It was released in 1969 based on the book written by Muriel Spark, who's an Edinburgh-based author. And the film was The Prime of Miss June Brodie. It would also work really well as an audio drama. Maggie Smith, one of my most favourite actresses, played the lead. She played Miss Jean Brodie and she just was fantastic in the role. It's also just a really good, fun film and it's a real classic, particularly where I come from. There's a line in it which you always see in the the clips um, where Maggie Smith in full, up to full height, she was slightly a slightly unhinged teacher trying to keep control of a, pretty much a bunch of uncontrollable girls. And the line that is really well known from the film is, my pupils are the creme de la creme. But every line she delivers is spot on. And it's a really, it's, it hasn't dated. It's, um, it's as fresh now as it was when it was released in 1969. So that's my classic. I hope everyone enjoys The Turn of the Screw once it's released. We certainly enjoyed recording it. Thanks so much, Rachel. Hello. My name is Ted Bjorndal, and I play Douglas in the Soul Twins audio adaptation of the novella The Turn of the Screw. Were you familiar with the story of The Turn of the Screw prior to playing the role? Uh, no, actually. I, uh, I, I wasn't in the least. When I was offered the role, I did do a little bit of research, and I did read the novella. Now, keep in mind, um, gothic horror is not my favorite genre, but I did find it a very interesting story, shall we say. Can you tell us about some of the projects you've been working on, either for your other companies or your own writing endeavors? Some other projects I've worked on? Well, the one that I'm the most proud of is the character Xander in Triple G Beast's Grand Theft Auto V The Zombie Attack Revelations. There I'm credited under Ted Meister 88. I'm actually the second actor to play the role, since the first actor just disappeared off the face of the planet and, well, couldn't be reached. When I first got the role, I did my best to mimic the original actor as much as possible using their own um, patterns of speech, their own inflections, but there's only so much you can do mimicking another actor's performance. I wanted to make the role mine, so I started putting my own touches on the character, including changing the voice a bit and... Uh, making the character sound far more insane. So you went from something that sounded something a little more subdued, something down here, to something that sounded way more up here, with far more confidence in his voice, and he's sure of his victory. I had so much fun with that role that uh, I'm kind of sad that it's over. Uh... I recorded my last lines back in March and sent them in. The finale has been recorded, 
and is going through the editing phase, so naturally I'm excited. But at the same time, yeah, I'm kind of bummed. But, oh well, there are more roles on the horizon. Other roles I've done was Rogue in 8-Bit Theater Chaos, Agatio in River Kanoff's aborted audio adaptation of the video game Golden Sun, Banquo in Macbeth, Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, and uh, this is going way back, but in high school, I was cast as Gilbert in a stage adaptation of the second Anne of Green Gables novel. I was also cast as the lead in a local, a local puppetry group that uh, was funded by the Canadian Mental Health Association. We would go around to the various elementary schools and uh, we would put on a show. We would teach the kids about disabilities, how to treat people with disabilities, and how people with disabilities are no different than people without disabilities. And uh, it's, it's a subject that's very, uh, it's very near and dear to my heart because uh, I am mentally ill, which is considered a disability in my home province. So when I was offered the opportunity, I lunged at it, grabbed it, didn't let go, and that season was quite possibly the most fun I've ever had on any sort of stage production. In fact, uh, not too long ago, I bumped into one of the students that that uh, watched one of the shows, and uh, the, the 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 season was the twenty ten twenty eleven, though we did most of our performance in twenty eleven uh, around April May early June, uh, just as classes are starting to wind down. Uh, an audience member who had fully grown up basically told me that well one they recognize me, and two that they are now going to university to become a psychiatrist, because the show had inspired them. When they told me this, uh, I started crying, because in my mind, I, I, I thought to myself, yes, I succeeded, and I... <laughs> there are no words that just describe how utterly elated I was that I had that effect. I, uh, I still keep in contact with that person, and they are, they are uh, giving me progress updates on their, uh, their, their studies. And I, it, it, it's just incredible. As for what I'm doing right now, I'm currently writing the four-part pilot episode of a sci-fi audio drama series that takes a lot of inspiration from all of the sci-fi shows that I watched as a youngster. Uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5, Battlestar Galactica, Macross, Macross 2, Macross Plus, all wrapped together into basically a single bundle that takes the best from each and presents it in an exciting action-adventure series. It's also my first time as a playwright, so I'm figuring out a lot of things as I go. Do you have a dream role? If I may be completely honest, no, not really, as weird as that sounds. I mean, sure, there are roles that I'd like to try, that I'd like to play, but nothing that nothing sticks out in my mind as something that 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 I would consider a dream role. To be honest, all the roles that I that I get are dream roles because hey, I'm doing something that I love. Do you have any suggestions for either an old time radio recreation or or something for patchwork classics? Well, this is just me, but I think it might be neat if Soul Twin Audios did adaptations of Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian stories. I mean, they're in the public domain, so... I mean, they're classic sword and sorcery stories filled to the brim with action and adventure and heroism. Those are the kinds of stories that I loved to read as a kid. Our last interview for The Turn of the Screw 
is with Adam Blanford. You're a man of many hats, voice actor, writer, producer, sound engineer. Out of all these roles, which is your favorite and why? I can't really say that I have a favorite among all of those because each one offers different challenges, offers different opportunities, and is rewarding in different ways. Um, you know, as a voice actor, I get to inhabit different roles. And so I get to, to give a performance and I get to evoke emotions in the audience, uh, whether they are uh, engaging in love-hate relationships. Uh, like uh, I, I did a show called Y2K and um, I played a, a part another British character, actually, uh, named Jono. And Jono was, quite frankly, a terrible person. And it, so for me, it, it was kind of rewarding because when I would look on social media, people would say, God, I really hate Jono. I, I just hear the voice and I get angry. Or I, I, you know, if I could punch one character in the neck in any podcast, it would be Jono. And I, I know that that's like, you know, people despise the character, but that tells me that I'm doing my job. So for me, that's a wonderful thing. Um, as a writer, I get to create entire worlds. So when I write shorts for anthology series, I get to try and create these, these, these pocket universes with different ideas and, and uh, different sensibilities. And I get, if I write stories, then being able to write stories is, is really entertaining because I start with nothing and I create an expansive world. Um, when I have the opportunity to write poetry, that's that's few and far between, but I really enjoy it. Uh, I wrote the the poem that was used for Turn of the Screw, and uh, it was an opportunity for me to um, stretch those poetic muscles, I suppose, because I haven't done it in a while. And it, it was it was fun because I got to use the word gloaming, which you don't get to use a lot in you know polite conversation. So uh, I I really enjoy doing that. And then as a producer and sound engineer, you get to take all those different pieces of the puzzle and put it together. And so, I, you know, you can take the audio that you've recorded, the stuff that you've written, you get to, you get to construct it and you get to control the pacing and the, the, the musical interludes and the sound effects and you get to be inventive. So for me, every part of it is rewarding in some way. And I, I, I can't say that I really can point to a specific favorite. What was your favorite part about being the sound engineer for Turn of the Screw? Was there a favorite part in the script you really enjoyed mixing? I think I would say that the, uh, the, the scenes with the jurors and the announcer and with Douglas, those were really fun because, you know, those scenes exist outside of the flow of the story. And you got to really play around with different things. Like, you know, at the very end of the, of the show... Uh, they, they rewind the governess's last line two times. And I'm like, okay, I get to try and figure out how to rewind this line. And that is her line, rewound. And so I set that up and I, I got to play around with that. I got to create the soundscape to try and figure out what was going on with this group of people and where they were at and what was happening, what was in the soundscape. And so I, you know, it was, it was fun to try and experiment with that. Um, I, I have to say, I also really enjoyed just mixing the scenes at Bly Manor because, you know, it, it's the, the story is what's driving everything. And so you want to make a soundscape that supports the story, but doesn't overwhelm it. So creating the, you know, the ticking clocks and the fireplaces and, you know, being able to, to put in the fact that someone's washing dishes and chopping vegetables, those are really subtle things, but they, add to that dimensionality that people want when they listen to a podcast. They want to feel immersed in the story. And so if you put in those very subtle touches, then you're creating that world. And people are like, well, you know, I didn't think about this, this detail, but yeah, that totally makes sense. Getting to design a, a comprehensive soundscape is a lot of fun. And so I, I really enjoyed mixing all of the story. But if, if you were to ask me, I, I think that I really enjoyed, uh, in particular, the, uh, the, the challenge of mixing together the dialogue from the jurors and, and Douglas and the announcer and rewinding things and, you know, just kind of creating this zany kind of bookend or bookends for the whole story. What other iconic classic story would you like to hear Saltwin Audios produce? Um, I can think of two ideas. Uh, number one would be uh, doing something in, from the Sherlock Holmes corpus that is in the public domain. Because let's face it, uh, voicing Sherlock Holmes or Dr. Watson or getting to do any of the various accents 
that were there are really fun. Um, I, I got to narrate an audiobook called Treachery at Torquay um, for Audible, and that was a lot of fun because I got to be the famous detective Sherlock Holmes, and it was quite entertaining. At the same time, I narrated as Dr. Watson, so I quite enjoyed being able to do that. And then also including all the different accents that I, I'm able to do within these various uh, stories was great. So I would love the opportunity to be able to do more. So those are always really fun. And as an engineer, that'd be a lot of fun because you get to create this comprehensive soundscape again, that really immersive and uh, reminiscent of Victorian London. Um, if we were to skip that, I would say, you know, something like Around the World in 80 Days would be great because public domain, uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, it, it's very exciting and it's, it's going to stir a lot of people's imaginations and it's going to be a real challenge as an actor, as an engineer, um, as, a, as a writer. I think across the board, that would be really fun. You have your own podcast called Ill Omens and Bad Tidings. Can you tell us a little bit about that and some of the other projects you've been working on lately? So uh, Ill Omens and Bad Tidings is a micro horror dark comedy anthology. And, and so I, it was the result of an experiment that I decided to do. Could I tell a story in the length of a single tweet that was comprehensive? So uh, it, it's, a, it's a fun process because I have to figure out how I'm going to tell a story using a limited number of characters what parts of the story I can tell using just the soundscape and the music that I can find that's in the public domain. And so I've, I've currently done one season. It's about eight episodes long. And so it shows a uh, different, uh, different worlds, like one with a, a cursed mask, another one where a guy's trying to flee the zombie apocalypse. Uh, another one in which a, a vampire is contemplating whether he should end his own existence. So uh, it, it's really entertaining. It's a lot of fun for me to do, and I hope that people listening to it enjoy it. Uh, so uh, check it out. It's on Apple Podcasts and wherever fine podcasts are produced or not produced, uh, supported. There we go. Uh, some of the other projects I've been doing. Um, so in uh, April, I finished an audiobook called uh, Treachery at Torquay. It's a Sherlock Holmes story. And uh, so it's available on Audible. I just finished another audiobook. It's in post production right now called Deeper Than Hell by Joshua Milliken. Uh, it's with Encycle Apocalypse Publications. It's it's a lot of fun. It's about a heroin junkie trying to get to the uh, the center of the world. And it's a very trippy story. I I think people have described it as Clive Barker meets Alice in Wonderland meets Dante's Inferno. Totally accurate, but I it's one of my favorites. I I I love it. I and I hope you'll love it too. Um, I'm also working on writing different series. Uh, I'm collaborating with the uh, creator of Cascadia, uh, Adam Marciano, on uh, a couple of different series. One's uh, one a uh, comedy, one a, a horror series. So we're having a good time with that. Um, and then I'm also working on different things like uh, sound engineering for uh, a podcast that'll be coming out at some point called Cataclysm Black. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 keeping busy. Um, I'm also a commercial voice actor, so I'm trying to get my name out there. And uh, yeah, I just uh, throw my voice out there wherever I can uh, get the opportunity. So if anybody wants to use my dulcet tones, you know where to find me. Uh, so thank you for having me on, and I really appreciate the opportunity to answer questions. <laughs> Here at Soul Twin Audios, I've already produced a few episodes written by Lucille Fletcher. Dark Journey, That Thing in the Window, and soon you'll hear the classic episode called Fugue in C Minor. Coming soon to Soul Twin Audios. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe organs. It's a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What's she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe, and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because he killed her. Fugue in C minor, starring Rhiannon McAfee and Pete Lutz. I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to chat with one of the leads for that upcoming recreation. Hi, Rachel. Glad to be here. Thanks for asking me. You've played several roles for me here at Soul Twin Audios. 
from the creepy Martin Ames and that thing in the window to Edgar Linton in Wuthering Heights, and now the lead of Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. Which role was your favorite to perform? Well, while I have enjoyed playing those roles that you mentioned, uh, especially uh, Theodore in Fugue in C Minor, or as I like to call it, Fugu in C Minus, I'd have to say that my favorite role is the one I haven't been cast in yet. I don't want to give any hints, but it's one that you've promised me, and I'm really looking forward to playing that one. <laughs> Here at my company, we produce many recreations from suspense. Do you have any suggestions for either another suspense recreation or another radio series we have yet to produce that you would like to hear? Well, suspense is definitely one of my favorite shows, too. I have, well, I started collecting cassettes of suspense in the uh, in the early 90s when uh, when you could buy them through catalogs i bought the best of suspense volume 2 through a particular catalog and then maybe 10 years later i found the best of suspense volume 1 in a little shop in chicago called metro golden memories and it was just that was a wonderful store that doesn't exist anymore unfortunately and i only got a chance to go there once but anyway, um, when it comes to another suspense recreation, I'm hard-pressed. I would say um, if I had to choose something with William Powell in it, he was wonderful. Something with Cary Grant in it, um, he was terrific. I think um, James Stewart in Consequence was pretty wonderful. That was a excellent post-war episode about a, uh, a World War II veteran. Orson Welles, you know, I'm a big fan of Orson Welles. Some people may know this. Or any of the episodes that had Orson Welles in it. Was it The Marvelous Barastro or something like that? He plays a mind reader. In those days, Orson could do no wrong. So any of those would be good. Um, and you also ask about other series. Oh, my. Um, Escape is good. If you wanted to delve into any of the um, uh, private detective series that were that came out, uh, Philip Marlowe, I think um, Richard Diamond was really good. Richard Diamond, of course, is a funnier version of Sam Spade. And that was written by Blake Edwards, believe it or not, um, who later went on to fame as the uh, director of the Pink Panther movies. But I think those are any of those would be terrific for your company to tackle. In my premiere episode... I played the promo of your series, The Cellar. Could you tell the listeners a little bit more about that series and what's next for it? Well, thank you so much for uh, playing my promo. I created The Cellar primarily to showcase two things. The first thing I wanted to showcase was the best in pulp fiction horror and original horror, either written by myself or written by guest playwrights. And the second thing I wanted to showcase was our host or hostess, Ms. Cadavra Quivery, who is somebody I describe as the love child between Bella Lugosi and Julia Child. It was uh, <laughs> a lot of fun to come up with the uh, uh, openings and closings of each episode of The Cellar because I was able to tap into a great uh, source of, of morgue-type humor and horrible puns and really awful jokes and have a woman who is kind of creepy and kind of uh, flirty tell them and make it all, all about uh, living in this uh, eerie cellar, uh, which is where the stories come from. So I owe a, a debt of gratitude to Inner Sanctum, of course, because I borrowed a sound very like the squeaking door and made it the squeak of Cadavra opening her big book of stories. So if you want to hear that, that's there at the beginning of every episode. So we had one full season of 12 episodes. Then we went on hiatus for a while. Then last year in October, I produced five in a row for a mini series for the Mutual Audio Network's Transcontinental Terror series. And those came out over the five weeks in October last year. So I thought, what better way to showcase 
the seller and get a lot of episodes out of the way uh, by repeating that magic in years to come. So uh, in October of this year, we're going to have another five episode mini series of the seller. And um, whereas last year's kicked off with your prize winning episode, which is going to be a series phobia is unlimited for you. We are doing the final three prize winners of the 2019 uh, script writing contest that I've hosted. Uh, we're doing Terror on Edge Island, The Game, and The Renegotiation. Those three. So we had four top winners. You were second place, but since you'd already produced yours, <laughs> uh, we, we went with it last year. The f- uh, first prize was Terror on Edge Island, and then third prize was The Game, and co-written by John Bell and a friend of his. Then we're going to have one by me called Get Me Out of Here, which is semi-autobiographical. I will say no more on that. Oh, I will say that it's written in the style of Quiet, Please. So heavy on uh, first-person narration, telling a story with other voices coming in, much in the way Willis Cooper did. And um, Willis Cooper and I, by the way, came from the same little city in uh, central Illinois called Pekin, Illinois. We both graduated from Pekin High. He graduated in 1916 and I graduated in 1981. So, you know, just 65 years apart. But the story itself, Get Me Out of Here, is set in Pekin. Fictitious story with my mother and father as the main characters that takes place in the house I grew up in. And here I go and I say I'm not going to say any more and then I give all that stuff away. Ah, well, I just love the story and think it worked. It just came into my head and, as a full story. And um, I, I love it. And then the fifth one will be a, a story called Gear Jammin'. And that's by Mark Slade. And his story is adapted from a 1970s TV series called Moving On about two truckers who uh, share driving duties in an 18-wheeler, and they have adventures all over the place. But here, in this one, it's a very strange supernatural adventure that Mark Slade wrote uh, specifically for me to uh, feature in the cellar. So I'm pretty happy about that. So those five are going to be the miniseries season two coming up in October of this year. Like me, you produce episodes for Jack Ward's Summerstock Playhouse. Which ones are you producing this year, and which ones have been your favorite to work on? Who Summerstock. Summerstock's my favorite time of the year. It really is, because um, mainly because I plan for these so far in advance. So um, this year we're doing three, and two of them are extremely long. They're two hours each. And so they're broken up into two parts, but the two parts will be featured, will be released the same day. Uh, For example, July 3rd, you'll hear part one, and then you can go to part two immediately. That's going to be the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. And that was produced by the BBC, believe it or not. It was uh, um, on their Sunday Night Theater series back in, I believe, 1958. So um, it's definitely um, a a remake of an old-time radio show. The other one is 20th Century an episode of uh, Campbell Playhouse with Orson Welles. The third one is from Lux Theater. We're doing the non-musical version of Les Miserables. (laughs) Thank goodness. (laughs) We're just doing three this year. I enjoyed working on all three of them. I think Kane Mutiny is very moving. It's got a wonderful cast. It it, it all takes place in in a courtroom, so there's no real action. It's all done with uh, um, the voices and the minimum sound effects, really, just minimum sound effects, uh, because I didn't want to do a lot of standing and walking to the stand and from the stand. It, it didn't seem necessary. So I went minimalist. And uh, when a witness is called, instead of having the sound effect bringing him up to the stand, we just have a musical transition for most of those. And uh, I think that works really well. Uh, the music, of course, all of the music for my these productions was composed by Ross Bernhardt. And I, he's, he's just a terrific composer. He's created music for me for years and also creates music for our live shows. Uh, but my favorite over the years, I've been doing it since 2015 and have produced several. I mean, there were years where I was doing four per year for three years running. Um, and then another year where I just, I just did two last year. And uh, this year I'm doing three. Um, but last year... I did Algiers, which I really loved, 
and uh, was very, very proud of that. And that's a Lux Theater production, but we extended it um, because the movie's in the public domain. So I found the screenplay and I added dialogue back in that was cut out um, and, and scenes, entire scenes that were cut out of the Lux Radio production. And I put them back in because it really rounded out the story and uh, made it move really well. And again, a fantastic cast. <laughs> if you haven't heard Algiers, you really should hear it. Uh, but my absolute favorite in terms of story, cast, music, th- the soundscape that I was able to create has to be East of the Sun, West of the Moon, which came out two years ago. Um, that was a, a remake of a B- an, another BBC production uh, by a, a poet and audio drama writer named Louis McNeese. He was pretty prolific. He, uh, several books of his radio plays were published. And that's where I got East of the Sun and West of the Moon from one of his books. Uh, and I think next year I'm going to do another one that he put out that's just a fantastic story. Very complicated. Very complicated story. He wasn't one for fluff. Um, even, even East of the Sun, West of the Moon being a fairy tale doesn't have any fluff in it, unless you count the bear's fur. But that <laughs> is my little joke. So, um, again... I have favorites from the past, but uh, I think my absolute favorite is the one I haven't done yet. So um, I'm going to keep doing Summerstock until uh, I get tired of it, which isn't going to be anytime soon. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking with you today. As always, stay safe, be happy, and always remember... I can do anything. I can reach any goal today I can do what I want I can be what I want to be You've been listening to Soul Twin Talk. I'm your host, Rachel Pulliam. And I would like to thank all of the guests who appeared on the show today. Tanya Rich, Fiona McKinnon, Ted Bjorndal, Adam Blanford, and Pete Lutz. I had a lot of fun, and I hope you did too. All music, except for some transitional pieces from Storyblocks, was composed by Ross Bernhardt. The Weston U commercial featured the voice talents of Pete Lutz, Nikki Wagner, and Jalen Frisbee. Dan Ware was featured in The Cottages commercial. Stay tuned for promos and a very special demo by Diamond Matthews. What happens when the world's worst detective, oh, that's supposed to mean me, finds himself in a TV reality ghost hunting show with a million dollar prize? (laughs) I don't believe in ghosts, so this should be easy. Shouldn't it? Commencing Operation Swapping Seas Plans for the Sequence of Hui Clans. Now! What kind of women I used to get in the monastery? None. Get it? None. Ha! Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a... Oh, wait, that sounds medical. Medical I can do. He's been out here with nothing on but a bed sheet, staying at the moon, and nothing's happened. Except I got ant bites on my ass. So, memories? Boy, if my friend could see me now, say, would not be liberate. In the course of human history, what one man stood above all others for acting particularly ghastly? You're Steven Seagal? Jack West stars in Canterville's Ghosts. All episodes now streaming. Did I mention it's a fantasy comedy? <laughs> they don't know that you have this? You're the key to the city's advancement. I didn't realize Callan needed saving. It most certainly does. A world without war and devoid of religion gets unintentionally reintroduced to both. You treat them like they were some ancient gods deserving of worship. They have nowhere to go. Please show mercy. What are you doing? Please. 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 You're nothing. You've always been nothing. You should sleep with one eye open. No. No. Hey, Father, I need you to come with me. You of all people know my aversion to the lies the Chiesa created. The Chiesa is tearing us apart. I'm going to join the Founders. I don't think that's how that works. I would like to think so. It is going to change the course of history. Well, why don't we call it what it truly is? A cult. Forever provided! Universe 25, anywhere podcasts are.
From Marky Witt's Audio Works comes a suspenseful tale of murder and redemption. Many years ago, I killed a man. His name was Fortunato. Based on the 1846 short story by Edgar Allan Poe. I am to take my leave for a previous engagement. I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and, well, I have my doubts. Let us go. Whither? Why to your vaults? <laughs> How long have you had that cough? Oh, it is nothing. Proceed. Herein is the Amontillado. Hey! hey. <clears throat> Come now! Release me from these chains and... Stop that infernal racket! You have no idea the pain you have caused me. In pace requiescat. The Cask of Amontillado. Available now. I ask all of you, tune in to Radio Free Tyrannus. Listen to Midnight Terry. Consider his words. The fight for freedom has begun. And we need you if we're going to win. It's a very small town. Pretty sure I know everybody by sight. In Wolfbrook, New Hampshire. Welcome to Unhallowed Grounds. There's not much else out here worth being scared of. There is something outside of my house. It's gonna come through the windshield. What the hell happened here? Have you noticed anything strange? It just felt really weird. It has started again. It has started again. And what is with all this purple goo? Something the size of a Buick and dripping purple goo. I remember. I could put you in a very small concrete room just because. Could someone explain to me what's going on? I thought you were something else. Don't you mean someone else? No. There's no use in getting worked up over something that never happened, is there? Coming September 2022. Introducing Chili's Curbside Pickup. Fresh food fast in four easy steps. Order online, pay ahead, and select Curbside with your Chili's app or at Chili's.com. Groove It gives you infinite inspiration because it comes with a massive collection of more than 25 lines. That's over 25,000 loops made exclusively for Groove It. Shop now for athletic, dress shoes, work boots, and casual everyday safety wear. Jumpstart your workday at shoesandcruise.com. Many people fear the dangerous effects of ultraviolet rays on the skin, but few realize the danger imposed on their eyes. That's why, here at Target Optical, we make it easy and affordable for you. In our industry, we know that hospitals are one of the most hazardous places. Firm right safety and health management systems, reducing workplace hazards before they ever happen. Earn an online degree at Learn Now. Whether you're taking your first college courses, studying at the undergraduate or graduate level, or transferring to finish your degree, you can do it all as an online student at Learn Now. <laughs> 